From the beginning, the images we have created have stood like mile-markers on the road of human progress. What once was is now because artists made it so. They captured a moment and made it eternal. Where did they get such power? Well, it was given to them, passed down through the ages, master to student, each building upon the other. John Stobart, one of the most accomplished artists of our time, says, I don't think the greatest works have yet been done. And it's true, but only if the secrets are given to yet another generation. The first secret is this. It is not in the hand, it is in the eye. Follow us and we'll show you that once you learn to look at the world differently, it becomes a different world, one in which nature becomes the greatest teacher of all. On Laguna Beach, John Stobart creates a simple landscape that illustrates the basics of mixing colors, seeing a subject as a series of shapes, and his style of painting human figures with a few simple brushstrokes. A lot of people in America may not realize the fascination that there is for this particular part of the world from people coming from England. There's been so much written and so much glamorized about America, and California seems to be the epitome of the, of the wonderful place to go and live if ever you get the opportunity. And uh, so I was really fascinated to come here, and uh, I would think it was the beginning of uh, the 70s. I remember uh, having the privilege of going to stay with somebody and uh, they met me at the airport and when we arrived at their house which was in Toluca Estates which is right next door to Universal Studios there was a film crew right in front of their house they were filming uh, late at night and they were hosing down the driveway and I was absolutely fascinated by this because I, I almost felt that I was in the movies myself, that I'd suddenly got into this new world that, uh, that I'd appreciated so much as a boy. Now, when this county of Orange was founded in 1889, there were only three cities here, Santa Ana, Orange, and Anaheim. And one of the things that happened was that in 1955, the Santa Ana Freeway came through from Los Angeles south. And this suddenly opened up the whole area. Disneyland was put in in 1955. And this resulted in a ballooning economy, which has become one of the largest in the world. Now there are 29 cities in Orange County, and two and a half million people live here. Despite this enormous growth, one of the most stunning aspects of the coast of California, is the natural beauty of these hills, the way they come down to the sea. What I'm establishing here is where the horizon line is because it's very important to get that right. It's going to be a little bit lower than the middle. There we are, right about there. And uh, yes, that's lovely the way that little gazebo is on the hill with the palm tree on the left. I'm going to have the palm tree here. A little bit of a bunch of palm trees. I can't go all the way up to that very big one. So I'm gonna have the palm trees there. And here's Laguna, Laguna Beach, right in the, in the setting. That's beautiful. Lovely rocks in the foreground, backlit right to the end. That's lovely. Make a nice little painting. I'm blocking in the, the main hill behind Laguna there 
because I want to be all the way to the, I want to make sure that I have that right, that tip of Dana Point, which we're looking at right in the distance there. Every artist has his own way of doing things and I'm only demonstrating the way I do it and the way I've been taught and brought up to do it. And the, w the way which has come second nature to me now. And one thing about starting is that a, a lot of artists draw first. Uh, in my view, that is not really necessary. Because if you draw, for instance, we don't see a whole lot of lines in front of us here. We see shapes. I like to get the basic shapes established, and then I may want to move something. So if I've drawn it before, what's the point of drawing it? There's no point for me in drawing anything here. I use only paint, and I like to get it established very simply, very quickly. That dark will be right there. Nice dark piece right down to that. There we are. What we see before us here is a series of interlocking shapes, overlapping silhouettes. And what happens if you draw all this, you really aren't conscious of where the masses of color are and where, where one mass ends and where another begins. How can one create that with a line? And so that seems to me to be moot because I wouldn't want to draw this and then have to change it again. The simplicity of this, to my way of thinking, is the basic silhouettes. The story that familiarized me with the West Coast and made me want to come here was Richard Henry Dana's Two Years Before the Mass. And he came round Cape Horn to this coast in 1835. And that was quite a feat in itself because it was a little tiny vessel, not more than, much more than 100 feet long. And uh, what they did, they bought hides from the Mexicans on these cliffs and all the way down to Dana Point in the distance, right there, behind there, was one of the stops that they made. And they collected hides and paid the Mexicans a dollar for a hide and sold them in Boston for four dollars. When they came to fill the ship with hides again, what Dana didn't know was that his boat had been designated to stay here as a kind of warehouse so that the, the hides could be kept in his boat, which was the Pilgrim. It was actually a brig, a two-masted sailing ship, very small, with a crew of about six or seven. What uh, happened to Dana, by the way, on the Pilgrim was that he had never realized the brutality that went on between the, the mates and the the captain and the and the crew, they were really, they were flogged and and there was no, there was a sort of discipline under unto itself, and there were no real laws to to protect the seamen. And when Dana got home to Boston finally after two years, he made presentations to Congress, and uh, all the laws were changed because of his experiences. Lovely color in that cliff there. The cliff is not just one color all the way along, but the strata of the, the cliff, uh, I see here, there are gray pieces and blue pieces even, and yellow pieces and orange pieces, and these are all in the sunlight, and the, it's very, very difficult to paint. For me, I find the difficulty painting uh, something that's blue, a blue rock, in the blazing sunlight. That is a difficult thing to do. But there it is, the answer's here before me. A lot of books have been written about color, and some of them are very complicated, and I think too complicated for the beginning student. Uh, what you've really got to realize is that instead of reading a book, the whole thing is right in front of you outside, and it's by observation and going out and just trying it that you'll suddenly get the hang of it. Uh, this is not something that you need to read about. It's not a theory. It's a visual thing. It's an observed thing. And more observation, more practicing, little paintings, even if you make a mess of it. 
the quicker you'll catch on to what's happening out there. And I want to just explain how the color spectrum is, is uh, broken up. Because if a, a, if a ray of light hits a spectrum in a certain way, it bounces off into, divides into the primary colors and secondary colors. Now, all artists have their own way of setting up their colors. A lot of artists have a, 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 a very extended palette and have maybe 15 to 20 colors ranged on the palette. But right from the earliest days, I was taught always to have very few colors, and then it rather tends to get more balance into the painting, and there's more continuity of color. Now, see how simple this is. Here's the yellow and the blue and whoops the red there we are now red and yellow make orange so we'll take a little bit of red and mix it with the orange mix it with the yellow that makes orange there. have it as bright as that have it more to that or more to that now we'll take the Blue and the red, put a bit more red out there. Take a little blue there. Now that is purple or magenta. Let's put this in here. There we go. There's the purple. See, we've already got now five colors. Now the sixth one here is green. I need a clean brush here for this, really. Take that and that, and here's green. See, that's very simple. Now we've got six colors out of our three. And as we add, we go on and on, we get more and more colors. And the complementary colors are opposite. This color here is the complement of yellow. The green is the complement of red. And the orange is the complement of blue. And it's important to know those very simple, basic rules about color. The sky is very gray this morning. We're looking right into the light. Everything here is pretty well backlit, which is a wonderful, you can get more of a sense of light when you've got a backlit view like this. What I'm being careful to do is to make sure that some of the ground that I've tinted very slightly with burnt sienna, a very light wash. And what I've done, I, I want little bits of that to sparkle through. So I want to be careful to leave some of that. And the story about that is that uh, way back in, when I was at the Royal Academy in London, uh, I went down to the Victoria and Albert Museum and saw the absolutely wonderful outdoor paintings by Constable that are there. And they're very small. They're only about 10 inches wide, many of them. And they were all done on the spot. And he put a, a reddish ground on all his canvases before he started to paint. And uh, he left little bits of it showing all over the canvas by the end of the day, uh, and probably not intentionally either. Uh, and it tended to tie the things together so wonderfully. And I think the sight of those sketches at the Victoria and Albert Museum uh, gave me a tremendous kick. That's a wonderful lesson, and uh, I've, I've never forgotten it. Now I've established the, that sky color there. Now I'm going to establish the sea color, which is a little bit more blue. That's about as dark as it's going to get right there. Then it's almost a gray out here.
What I'm doing here is picking out the shape of the rocks and the shape of that water there. See, it goes dark right there. It goes a little darker. This is where there are a lot of breaking waves right here, so I need to keep reserved so that there's a contrast between the breaking waves and the water. These aspiring artists, we've got to look at things and see shapes. And I look at this lovely patch of water here and I see a shape of darker blue in the lighter blue. Very important to get that, those shapes. And these overlapping shapes create the painting. That shape coming in, another one going in behind the cliff, the cliff itself, and all these rocks, they're all overlapping and make interesting silhouettes, and that's what makes up the painting. Now, one of the reasons that I chose this particular setting of Laguna is that it's one of the most attractive places on the whole of the Pacific coast. In 1835, when Richard Henry Dana came to this coast, there was nothing here at all, absolutely nothing. Now today, when you go to Dana Point, which is all the way to the right-hand side of the painting, and just beyond that headland, uh, you can go and see a replica of the Brig Pilgrim that Richard Henry Dana came to the West Coast in. And it's all beautifully managed there, and one can go aboard it and go to a little museum beside it and learn all about the West Coast. I'm establishing the darkest points in this painting, which are right in the foreground here. It's the contrast between the dark and the light that make, make the painting. And as they recede, the darks get lighter and lighter as they recede into the background. Here you'll notice on my palette, I've got a lot of thick, fresh color. And what I've got to try and do is not get flat color on here. I, I, want, I want each brush stroke to have about three or four colors in it that are roughly equal to what I'm doing on the, on the rocks, because the rocks have, I can see purple in there, I can see green, I can see um, yellow, red, brown. I clearly remember that when I, first went out painting back in the year one, uh, I um, had a lot of misgivings about whether I could really handle the medium and keep it clean and everything. And it does take a while that to, to keep the colors fresh and to basically learn the way you want to do it. You've got, it's all got to be done by trial and error. And that's what I found. It, it must have been, I would think, six months before I really got it. But when I did get it, it was so exciting that I really felt that I got it. Oh, gosh. Yes, and now I got pins and needles. <laughs> Boy, I got to stand up. Wow. Funny how that happens, but this is what happens to all artists at one time or another, I'm sure. Or anyone. I'm going to wait till that. Yeah, it's going away now. <laughs> That's funny. I think it's really important for all artists, both beginners and and. Uh, 
professional artist to get back to nature and work from nature to a certain extent because if they dream things up all the time from reference material uh, like I do for instance with my own historic paintings I think it's very important to come back outside and and learn look what I've learned here this is an incredible lesson out here the light and the way things change and the exciting things that happen that you could not possibly dream up uh, and I think it's very very vital for me as an artist and uh, all people who paint to do that to, to go back to nature and get refreshed and get your batteries charged very difficult doing this this is the, for me this is my My weak point is I don't do figures as much as I should, but it's a wonderful way to learn to paint, is to paint the human figure. There's nothing as good for the student of art who really wants to learn the subtleties of color and become really familiar with the craft. There's a lot of atmosphere between me and Dana Point, and it's got to be much more since I started, almost to the point where that end a promontory there is almost disappearing. And I'm, I like the look of it better now. So I'm going to lighten that hill just slightly so that I get a better recession. Now to lighten it, I'm going to again play with it until I think I've got it right. And I've got to test my way through this, which I'm doing now. There we are. That, that's hit it right on the nail. How lucky did I get there? Look at that. That's perfect. See how that disappears suddenly now? That's way back now. I can, we can hardly see that from here now. See that? Way back, isn't it? That's a very well-known promontory and the shape of it had a little blip on it there now that's going beautifully into the distance now now i'm going to do the buildings on the seafront there Now, as I'm getting to the detail here, I'm reminded very clearly about an incident that happened at the Royal Academy when I was a student there. One of the academicians uh, who used to come in, they, these were practicing artists. And one of them, a little man called Fleetwood Walker, was really revered in all our eyes because he'd been gaining a lot of notoriety due to the style of his portrait paintings. But Fleetwood Walker was a gruff little man and extremely blunt. 
And uh, when he came into the room the first occasion, we were all drawing from the model. And when he came to the, the fellow that was sitting next to me, he said, do you want to go to bed with that woman? And the fellow just went as red as a beetroot, very, very embarrassed, didn't know what to say. But Fleetwood Walker carried on by saying, you've made her look like a rock. Don't you know that there's flesh and bone there? You've got to get some sensitivity into that drawing. So of course, having heard that, I was terrified because I'd been finishing some rather fine pursuit details on my drawing that were completely unnecessary. Uh, and he'd been watching me from afar off, I think. And when he came up to me, he said, have you finished that? And I was very, very nervous. And I, I said, uh, um, not quite, no. Uh, and he said, do you know what I mean by finished? Well, by finished, I mean finished, ready for the waste paper basket. And that was a very crucial moment in my life because it told me a very, very important point that all artists should know. And that is that the whole thing is you must not try and finish the thing. You've got to stop to leave the viewer with some sort of participation to enjoy the way you've done something and your expression. I love coming back to Southern California. It's a very invigorating, vibrant place to be. The climate here is absolutely lovely and um, you can be absolutely certain that the sun is going to be 100% on your subject. I love that. As I said earlier, every artist has his way of doing things. And uh, some artists really like to paint indoors and achieve wonderful things by doing that. What I'm trying to stress is, though, that to go outside and paint from nature is a terrific way of recharging your batteries. And if there's anything that this series can accomplish, it's to show the aspiring artist and the professional artists alike that there's a terrific thing out there called painting from nature.